seen your presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, for myself, I'm lucky to say I have not ever experienced long-term problems with my back, but I have people in my life, obviously, who do. Mm. And here's a story I hear a lot. I'm in so much pain, I know it would be better if I did my exercises, but somehow I just never seem to get around to that. Mm. And so that's a, to me, that's a self-efficacy thing, but I'm wondering you know, what you have encountered about that kind of yeah. resistance in self-care. Yep, I, th I mean, pain is very aversive. Uh, it's an aversive experience. It's a powerful motivator of behavior. Um, I think what, you know, that's around motivational interviewing. The question then is how, how important and how big a problem is this pain to you? So, yeah, it's a really big problem. How is it impacting on your life? Well, it means that, I, you know, when I exercise, I hurt. So if you exercise and you're hurting, it's quite adversive. Yes. It, so if it's not that, then the question then comes down to saying, if they're saying, yeah, I feel better when I exercise, but I don't because I really can't be bothered, that's a different question. So then I'd be saying, well, how important is this pain problem to you? How much is it bothering you? Is it bothering you enough to stop you doing the things you love? Because if you're steering people to the things they love, if they love knitting and sewing and eating and you know, watching TV, then that's a slight problem. Then you've got to take a different angle. And I say things like, do you brush your teeth? They go, yeah, I brush my teeth. Do you enjoy it? Not really. Why do you do it? Well, because it's good for my health. So physical activity is really important for your health. And it's not just important for your skeletal health. It's important for your mental health. It's important for your social health. It's important for your cardiovascular health. So maybe thinking of it not as an option, but as just part of an important part of life is another way of looking at it. Very often we see that um, pain becomes a barrier, but then people think of it as an option, and I think it's, th it's the escalator and the stairs. How do you take, get people to take the stairs? And that really comes down to human choice, actually. But you want to give people every opportunity to make that choice. Great. Question in the back. Hey, Professor O'Sullivan. Thank you so much for coming all the way to this side. Uh, my name is Dan King. I'm a professor at uh, George Fox University. And um, I have a question. You said something about the therapist mindset, that that's one of the obstacles that yeah. we have. So one of the things that I see, or if you can speak on, is uh, specific versus non-specific yeah. low back pain, or mechanical versus non-mechanical. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, <laughs> the word non-specific back pain, we, we never would tell a patient that. Never. So the, the categorization really is, from, is taken from a research perspective to say, have you got something on a scan, like a tumor or a you know, nerve compression or a fracture that can be clearly correlated with the patient's clinical presentation or not? If you don't, then you fall into this gray zone, which is called non-specific back pain. That's a really a default and a failure of our system to realize that actually, so Martin, this guy has so-called non-specific back pain, but it's very specific. He's highly sensitized in certain structures, and it's linked to a whole bunch of factors that we can identify, that we can clearly articulate to him. So I would never tell him his pain is non-specific. I'd sit down and say, hey, these things are all multifactorial. Uh, and actually, you've got a really sensitized structure for a bunch of reasons. One is you're holding the crap out of your spine, locking yourself into hyperextension because you're frightened. And that's really sensitizing those structures. Two, you're not moving. Three, you're not relaxing. Four, you're freaking out and you're not sleeping. So that is going to really wind up your nervous system. That is not non-specific back pain. That is really, that is a specific disorder linked to a bunch of multi, multiple factors. And I think giving people these diagnostic labels is really unhelpful. Giving people a multidimensional explanation is really helpful. So we think you've got to change the label system around back pain to say, hey, the cool thing is, is it doesn't look like your scan's your problem. But actually, there's a whole bunch of things we've identified in your story that you can change that can make an impact on your health. That's where we're going to go. And so sitting down, as you've seen the last two days, where you articulate and go, does that make sense? And they go, got it. So what in that can you change? I can change A, B, C, and D. Cool, that means you're on a journey. So those diagnostic labels are not helpful. Um, the second question was mechanical, non-mechanical, not very helpful again. So 
I've, if you followed any of my work, you might have seen that we kind of evolved over time. We used to think in terms of subgroups, we don't do that anymore. So the idea of subgrouping people or boxing them is actually not helpful. Um, the best description of subgrouping I've seen uh, was by a guy called Sapowski, who I think is at Stanford, and he, just said, he said, we describe a rainbow in terms of seven colors, but actually there's a million colors in a rainbow. We just describe them as seven because it's easy to communicate what a rainbow looks like. So in the same way of pain, we have profiles. You have profiles of tissue sensitivity. You've got profiles of movement. You've got profiles of mood. You've got profiles in terms of levels of physical activity and sleep. And those profiles we can look at across multiple dimensions. Every human being will have a profile that's different to someone else. So we look at characterizing pain, not in boxes, but in terms of profiling across multiple dimensions, it's so much more helpful both for us as clinicians and also for patients. They don't feel boxed and wedged into one category. It's a long answer, I know, but it's a great question. Can you come to Oregon and teach us that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Actually, I've got a cool story about Oregon. Was that Oregon, John? We were, we were kayaking, John and I were kayaking down a river in Oregon in a tent. This big bear came out and it was like, when we were in the tent, this bloody big bear was out and he was like, got into the food and we're like going, ate the honey, ate the butter and we're like, oh, don't eat us. <laughs> so I'll just make sure I bear, bring my bear protector. We had a question over here, Jody. My name is Jody Hutchinson, I'm a massage therapist, and I'm yeah. the spouse of a low back pain patient. Yeah. My wife has had three spinal surgeries. The last one was a very intense AP fusion last June. Yeah. How can I, as a spouse, be a good caregiver, but not yeah. do myself in? You know, yeah, it's such a, <laughs> look at, you know, you can't, look, you can be a supporter, but you can't be the caregiver. I, look, I don't treat family members, and it's so important that you don't, because it just creates this whole mixed package. And it's, you know, to be living with someone who's profoundly disabled carries its burden, and I'm sure you know what that feels like. Um, and that's a tough, that's tough, but making sure that you can link your wife to people who are empowering and positive and supportive that can set a path that she can take control and pain is really important. We see a lot of people post-surgery and it's the interesting thing around surgery is like once it's fused, it's fused. Like, you know, treat it like a normal back. She's but just people stiffer than hell. walk around like they're still damaged even though it's fused. So a lot of that stuff is enduring. You know, it's like then they go, oh, but the next level. You know, oh, the surgeon said, well, you've got to protect your back and don't bend because you can start, you know, that's going to go up. We're going to have to do the next one. You know, you just create this other fear. It's, you know, it's, it's, so, it's enough to freak them out by having your back chopped, but then to freak them out think, oh, my God, I've got to protect the ones above. And the crazy thing is the more you protect, the more you load, the less you move, the faster you're going to get un, unwell in those regions of the body. So, you know, that... We, we work with people who have had multiple fusions and say, hey, just treat that like a normal part of your body. And, but having a partnership with people who can take someone on that journey is so important. So that, that's what I would encourage you to do. Now, in terms of how you support someone on that journey, it's hard if they're being channeled down a medication route or a passive dependency route, but if they're not, then it's much easier. The surgeon then, was actually very kind and said, I'll have you off the pain meds in three months, awesome. and that worked. He said, you can go skiing in a year if you want. Awesome. So that's we don't ski, but she, yeah, so, <laughs> so we've been lucky. Great. So that's great, Yeah, because that, that, that can be really undo people. Cool. Question in the back, Eric? Yeah, we got a microphone right over here. Hey, Peter, uh, Ray uh, posted a thing on Facebook uh, that you were talking about nerve compression and how mm. nerve compression did not cause pain, but inflammation yeah. uh, does. But you don't tell your patients that inflammation causes pain, right? Uh, well, if it's an acute inflammatory cytica, it's an inflammatory process. Sounds like no SIBO to me, too. Sorry? Sounds like no SIBO to me, too. Um, I think it's honest. <laughs> it's actually good. It's good evidence. I mean, if you sprain your ankle acutely, you've got inflammation around your ankle, do you say it's not inflammation? It doesn't mean it's damaging. It doesn't mean it's threatening. So I think it's what you take from something. You know, if, you've got, if, you're chemical, if you're sensitized around a structure, 
It doesn't mean you don't move. It doesn't mean you use it. It doesn't mean it's going to be damaged. I just don't see the difference in telling them. What do they know about inflammation? So what's the same as telling them that they have a disc to me? I mean, I don't see the difference. Yeah, I do they know what it, inflammation is? I suppose is? it depends on how you interpret that. So I don't see chemical change around sensitized structures as a threat. It's, it's changeable. It's modifiable. That's they go home to their husband change. and say, man, I've got a lot of inflammation. You know? And then they start relating that to what they hear about inflammation okay, and fibromyalgia. What, okay, that comes down to your mindset of understanding what that means. So Mine or theirs? Both. Both. But that's our job to be educators. So if someone has, you know, I'd be saying the benefit of you know, managing pain is about engagement and activation of understanding that these things resolve. Natural history of sciatica is fantastic. You can have massive prolapse that will completely resolve within a period of, you know, weeks to two or three months. That, that is the, the threat around uh, prolapse is people are thinking, I've got pinched nerves that are crushed and, you know, that, that's around a sensitized nerve. It's not around a, comp it's not around a compressed nerve. So I will talk about the nerve being sensitized. Yeah, I get, I get that. That's the same. Okay, thank you. We have a, we need a microphone way over here on the, and then there, our next question will be up in the front row. Thank you. Hi, my name's Raven Trevelyan. I'm a massage therapist in Seattle. I work with populations that a lot of times have been told that their symptoms are all in their head or yeah. they've been accused overtly or covertly of malingering. Yeah. So a lot of people are very attached to a nocebic definition because it's yeah. an objective evidence right. that they are not malingering. Yeah. I wondered if you've had to approach that in your practice yeah. and if you had any tips. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, it comes down to this issue of validation. So validation is probably one of the most important things you can give your patient is that your pain is absolutely real. It's a real experience uh, that your, your, the distress that goes with pain, your concern around pain, your fear of pain is a valid experience. And I think when people aren't validated, that creates a huge amount of resistance. Telling people that their pain is in the head is profoundly unhelpful and you know, there's a huge amount of kickback to that because it makes people feel like they're not validated. And I think, so you know, you, it's, it's almost like a default that if you don't feel validated, you've been told it's in your head, then you default back to hanging on to something that's tangible. The really hard thing about diagnostic labels, and that's what we want. People want a diagnostic label. It's really frustrating for them if they don't. So there's almost this relief if they find something on a scan because then they've got a diagnostic label they can hold on to. The problem with that position is it leaves you with no, nowhere to go because then you become defined by this structural pathology. And so there's a middle ground in that space around it's not, you know, this is not, you know, you, this is a, you have a valid problem the, but to shift them away from thinking that they're damaged is terribly important to, to build someone's confidence to manage their problem, but to not invalidate them to tell you this is just something in their head. And that's where I think if you take the, the things out of their story, it is their story. You're not telling them something that's about your, in your head. You're actually taking the pieces of the puzzle from their story and you're putting it back. It's, and I kind of see it like the, our patients come to us with a whole bunch of pieces in a puzzle in a box. They don't know what the puzzle looks like. They just know all the pieces are there. And so we take those pieces and we go, hey, do you see this picture? I can make this puzzle for you. Do you see that? And you show it to them and they go, that makes sense. Now, to say, oh, yes, yeah, in your head, or it's about this, is just taking one, well, it's a piece that doesn't fit in the puzzle, actually. But actually to take the pieces of their story and relay it back to them is very validating because it tells you you've listened, you've understood, you've interpreted, and you're relaying back. That takes a middle ground. Thank you. Right up front here. Hi, um, I'm Alice Sambino, and I'm a massage therapist. And I had a, a comment and a question. And the comment was, the photograph you had of the stairs with the elevator or escalators, uh, reminded me of a clinic that I was I studied at briefly in Latvia and in the clinic 
in the central part, there's this big, wide, beautiful staircase, and that was everybody's default way of getting from one floor to another, and people would meet each other on it. And there was an elevator, but it was way over in the corner, and people who couldn't negotiate the stairs mm -hmm. would use the elevator. Um, but the stairway was the default, and here it's the opposite, where yeah. the elevators are central and the stairs are in the corner, and they're kind of scary and hard mm -hmm. to find. And I thought, brilliant to set it up to get people that that's a default. Yeah. The question I had was, um, earlier in your talk, you had some graphs about the incidence of low back pain, mm -hmm. and it kind of starts pretty young, and, and then it kind of levels off. Mm -hmm. And the common conception is as you grow older, you're going to have more pain. It's not true. And I've seen that before, and yeah. I just uh, wondered what you had to say about that. Yeah, it's not true. So there are lots of really un unhelpful beliefs around pain, like it gets worse as you get older. Actually, it tends to tail off. Um, probably other health problems become more dominant and so the focus shifts somewhere else, I think. Um, but um, actually, that, that peak is in the very early 20s and it doesn't really go up much beyond that. Uh, and then it tends to tail off in later life. So this idea that as you get older, you get worse is just not true. But I tell you what, it's, that's what people believe. Uh, you know, and the, the really the devastating thing, and we're really interested in doing some research into the elderly population, because every person has stuff on a scan once you crack 45. Every person has it. So everyone's got a pathoanatomical diagnosis, and they get told dreadful things like, oh, your back's stuffed, you know, it's crumbling, it's bone on bone. Same story we hear for the knee or the hip or other parts of the body as well. And so that has a devastating impact on someone around, they may be struggling already with their self-efficacy and the struggle of like losing function as they get older and then they're damned with this idea that they can't trust their body. I just think it's, it's, it's so horrible. But changing that understanding is terribly important that if you look at the prevalence of pain across time, it doesn't do what we think it does. So that's a great point you highlight. Just on this uh, issue of um, changing behavior, we have a television that's in the darkest, mis most miserable room of our house, so our kid never watches TV. And it's exactly the same as, um, you know, if you stick your television in your living area, in the nicest part of your house, it'll be watched. Stick it in the crummiest part of your house and no one's interested. It's like your escalator. We take one more qu we've got one more question, and this is from one of our online participants. Uh, Catherine Schopmeyer asks, is there, a huge, is there a large variability in the frequency or duration for your care plans using cognitive functional therapy? Oh, great question. Absolutely it is, yeah. So that's the journey. Everyone's journey is different. Everyone, everyone's journey into pain and disability is different. Everyone's journey out is different. That's why you have to be flexible. Uh, and it's around goal orientation. So that radar graph I showed you changes all the time. Pain fluctuates, you know? It's like we go, oh yeah, that's your trajectory. Uh, back pain actually looks like asthma. So if you look at um, an, a health disorder such as asthma, it's characterized for some people by acute flares and settles down. For others, it's this undulating process. Uh, pain, back pain looks like that. And so pain will emerge at times of stress and change. And so the journey will kind of match, work with that person on that journey. For some people, they grab the opportunity and run. For others, they need partnership that takes time. Um, most of the, in, this, the intervention studies that we've been involved in um, have tended to work with people over three months. We think that's like a good time frame to shift people. Uh, but we wean people off. So we might see them more closely at the beginning and the, we push the responsibility back to them and wean them off. But for others, they may need booster sessions down the track. For some, they've got it in three sessions and they're away. And then we might check them four or six weeks and then three months down the, track, down the track. But everyone's journey is individual. And that depends on social context, external factors, external stresses you know, demands, all kinds of things. You know, we see people who've got massive social stress, they're caring for kids, um, who've got depressive disorders, parents with Alzheimer's, they've got massive demands in their life. That will just make that journey tougher. So that just reflects us as human beings, that if you consider the dimensions, you understand the journey looks different. <laughs>